In fact, at one point, he said, if you do not bring that money in here, the only way you will get out of here is with six of those in your back. And he pointed at the swords and the knives and all of that that were on the wall. And I was convinced that he meant what he said. I was born in Leafy Barnhurst. And in those days, back in 1959, um, it was sort of aspirational for my parents, who had both come from South East London, to move out there into a, a leafy road with a semi-detached house. My childhood was, sadly, despite the very best efforts of my mum, was marred and was miserable because of the actions of my alcoholic, violent and abusive father, who quite frankly detested me and it was reciprocated. So it wasn't very happy until he left, which was when I was about 11. And to be perfectly frank, it was good riddance to bad rubbish. Then largely being the product of a single parent family in my teenage years, I went off the rails a bit. Um, I got quite involved in petty crime, none of which I'm remotely proud of in any way, shape or form. And I liked gambling. I used to bunk off school, go home, get changed out of my uniform and spend afternoons in the bookies. So one day I came home and to my horror, there was this enormous uniformed copper sitting in the lounge of the flat. And my first initial thinking was, Ooh, what am I going to get nicked for? But fortunately, my mum had had the, the vision and the foresight and the hope that policing might be for me. And this copper, who was proper old school, sat me down and explained to me the benefits of joining the police. And he did a brilliant, brilliant job. So much so that when he pulled out the police cadet application form from his coat and gave it to me, I filled it out pretty much there and then. And a few short weeks later, I was walking through the gates of Hendon Police Cadet College with a haircut that I thought was short enough and I soon found out wasn't short enough. And my life was massively transformed. So I had 18 months as being a police cadet. Then I got posted to Peckham in South East London, very lively then succeeded in my ambition of becoming a detective and at the age of 22 went to the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, don't you know, where I worked as a detective there for three and a half years. The next natural step, progression, ambition for me was to become a Scotland Yard detective and I was fortunate enough to be accepted onto the Central Drug Squad. So at the age of 25, when I was fit and fearless, with my shoulders back and my chest puffed out, I walked through the swing doors of New Scotland Yard, happy, proud, delighted to be a Scotland Yard detective, working then as part of the war on drugs. But then we thought we were all on the side of the angels and we were doing good stuff. And we combated drug smuggling on a global, international and wholesale kind of level. And it was very, very exciting. And how did you first find yourself involved with undercover police work? When I got to the yard, suddenly I was exposed to this very sort of uh, secretive world of undercover policing. So when I became aware of all of this, I thought, you know what? I think I could have a go at this undercover malarkey because I don't think anybody's ever going to rob me. And, and off I went and I discovered that I was pretty competent at telling lies. My background as being a bit of a South London oik stood me in good stead. I pretty much played that kind of character. So it wasn't a huge deviation from who I am, who I was. And uh, yeah, I went from that case to another case to another case and was fortunately rather successful along the way. What do you think it takes to be an undercover cop? 
to be a good undercover cop, you've got to be a very convincing liar. If you can't lie, don't apply. You also need to have an element of uh, courage because a lot of the time it's very nerve wracking. And also, equally as important, you have to be able to think on your feet, to be adaptable, because so much of what you do is business negotiation. What you're trying to do, predominantly, is achieve three things. Number one, to get the bad guys to bring the commodity to a location that works for you and the teams that are going to have to effect the arrests, whether it be gear, guns, a lorry load, artworks, whatever it may be. Number two, you've got to be able to kind of ensure that the arrests can be made properly. So that plot that you choose, that environment that you choose, where you want the bad guys and the goods to come, has got to be somewhere where covert surveillance can be carried out, in all its different guises, where an arrest team can be secreted fairly close by so that they can get there very quickly and affect the arrests. And then the third thing I often tried to achieve was make sure it was in a location where I could escape. So I could leg it somewhere and disappear over walls and through bushes and behind factories and through car parks and all of that so that perhaps the arrest team could say, yeah, a bloke disappeared off and was not captured. And I would always say, be the person that is as close to you as you possibly can be. Because, yeah, I was a South London kid, so I pretended to be a South London villain. I couldn't, for example, do what some of my colleagues did, and that was wear a bow tie profess to have been privately educated and be an expert in fine art. I couldn't have carried that off for a minute. What I could do was blokey, oiky, London, because the easiest lies to tell are the ones that are closest to the truth. And I used to tell all the youngsters coming through that we trained to don't try and be what you fundamentally are not. And when you sign up to, to go undercover, are you essentially signing your life away or do you go to work undercover and then come home and see your friends? It was a pretty uncomplicated way of doing things with regards to undercover work back then. One day you'd be working undercover, another day you could be on surveillance and another day the bosses might want you to smash somebody's front door down and go in and search the premises. And the more we did and the more we got successful, the bosses at Scotland Yard eventually realised that this needs to be professionalised, it needs to have its own particular unit and we need to have the facilities that we wanted put on an official footing and by that I mean the vehicles, the credit cards, the passports, the driving licences, all the kind of stuff that you would need to support your character in an undercover role. And in the mid-1980s, a little bit later than that, that's what they did. And I was a founding member of that unit. Did you ever have to take drugs yourself? And how was that experience? There had been occasions, rare occasions, when I had had to partake in those drugs. But you know what? Taking drugs when you're working undercover is really not a smart thing to do because you want your wits about you. You do not want to be stoned, eating four boxes of Maltesers and talking nonsense about understanding modern jazz. You're undercover. Likewise, you don't want to have been shoveling frigging Charlie up your Uta and be convincing everybody in the room that you're the most interesting person there when of course you are the most boring person there. You're working undercover. You want to have your wits about you. On some very rare occasions, when it was only going to be a deal breaker, I might take that joint. But then, on those occasions when it had to happen, if the bad guy pulled a bit of spliff or a bit of resin, 
resin, this is how long ago it was, ladies and gentlemen, out their pocket, right? I'd go, give me that, I'll build the joint. And I was very, very adept at putting a joint together. So if I knew this joint was going to go around the room and I'm building it, what I would do is I would backload it. In other words, at the front of the joint, what I'm only going to put there is tobacco. I'm going to backload it with the, whether it was green or resin, to, towards the back of the joint, towards the roach head, in other words. So I could build you a spliff like a baby's arm without a problem. So I build it, stick the roach in this, that and the other. It's a freaking work of art, right? And then I would say, I've built it, I'm sparking it. So backload it, spark it. That's one way you don't have to actually be smoking the gear. Another way, I was very adept at chopping up lines. Very, very, very good at it. And what I used to do and practice at home with a credit card and flour, whatever it may be, is I would practice making people's initials. Yes, I could do a line in the shape of an S. I could because I'd practiced and I'd practiced a lot. Obviously, doing an M or something is really easy. So when you're there and you say to the person, and what's your name? And he goes, Michael, fine, do a line in an M, right? It just takes, what I used to say, it takes the dairy off you a little bit. It takes the attention away from you. It takes the suspicion away from you because you're so adept at chopping up these lines and turning them into people's initials that they like it. It becomes a talking point and they kind of forget that you're actually not going to hoover up a line or two. Anything to actually negate the need for me to actually take gear because I'm working undercover, I'm not partying and I want my wits about me. Do you think people ever suspected you? Did you ever have any close calls? The criminals I was operating against were often extremely paranoid and cautious because they knew back in those days, you get caught with a parcel of two or three kilos of cocaine, you're going to get double figures when you get to the Crown Court. Easily. I got searched. Yeah, I, 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 didn't, I didn't have the ump with it because I didn't wear a wire. Some cops did. I didn't. And because I'd been stuck up against toilet walls and rubbed down on more than one occasion in my undercover career, I was fundamentally not going to wear a wire. I didn't want to run that risk. So they were paranoid, they were cautious, they were scared. And it was, again, part of my job to win their confidence, settle them down, act like grown-ups, be businesslike. And when, of course, you would negotiate with nutcases that would do that to show you the butt of the gun or would have the gun on the table as you nego negotiated, I would just go, forget it. I'm a businessman. I'm a professional. I'm not here on some kind of willy-waggling thing here to prove how hard I am, who's got the best weaponry, who's the toughest guy. I'm a professional businessman. I'm here to make money, not intimidate people, not frighten people, not show off and try and convince people that I'm hard. I'm a businessman. Let's do business. And if you insist on bringing shooters onto the plot, you can forget it, I'm out of here. And who were the kind of people, gangs, that you were involved in infiltrating? The crooks I operated against were a varied kind of bunch. And they came from all different backgrounds. Some were very suave and established career criminals. Some were youngsters just trying to carve their way within the industry. They'd got a bit of kudos, they could operate at a particular level and they were trying to increase their status within the drug dealing gangs. During the course of many of those operations, I was held hostage, threatened numerous times, stuck up against a wall, searched, encountered people that were carrying firearms and sometimes the bad guys would just nudge their jacket open to so you could see the butt of the gun so they let you know they were carrying all of which were pretty tense moments 
The most scary moment of all was when I was in North London, and this shows how long ago it was. There was a knife shop. It was called a knife shop. And all across the walls were knives, machetes, swords, all manner of weaponry that this bloke legally was selling. So I'd negotiated with another fella who eventually said, well, I better take you to my boss. And he took me to this shop where I met the shaven-headed, fearsome bloke behind the counter. And he was a pretty scary bloke. And I'd seen the parcel. I'd seen, it was about 25 or 30 kilos of cannabis or something like that. And by now there was Mr. Bald-headed Bloke and about three or four of his mates stood either side of me in this shop. And I was refusing to have the money, obviously the flash money that I'd booked out in New Scotland Yard. I was refusing to have that cash taken into the shop. And he was getting the raving ump about this. In fact, at one point, he said, if you do not bring that money in here, the only way you will get out of here is with six of those in your back. And he pointed at the swords and the knives and all of that that were on the wall. And I was convinced that he meant what he said. I had no idea whether the surveillance team had followed me and had seen me examining the parcel in the boot of the car. So I had no idea what was going on outside because there was no communication with them. Eventually, I put a phone call into my mate who was operating undercover, who was some way away with the cash in a car, in a covert role, of course. So I picked the phone up and I rang him and I said like, hello mate, um, all right, yeah, everything's fine. Um, can you bring the cash here? Now, of course, he knew that in undercover work, that was never gonna happen because we'd probably never see it again and that would make the commissioner very unhappy and all our bosses. And that's not how we operated. And he was a good operator, so when he was going, so he said, you sure, you want me to bring it there? And I was like, yes, yes, I'm absolutely sure. Please bring it here. Oh, but one thing, uh, before you go, mate, can you please remember, it's Jackie's birthday tomorrow, so you've got to pick up a card and a present. You do that for me? And he went, oh, yeah, 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 okay, mate, yeah, sure. All right, won't be long, see you soon. And of course, the code word for I am in very deep and I need rescuing was Jackie's birthday. So the minute I'd said to him, Jackie's birthday, he then immediately communicated with the arrest teams and everybody else and after a few minutes, which seemed like an eternity, um, suddenly, virtually the entire front of that shop disappeared and my colleagues came steaming in and, uh, and rescued me, for which I was very grateful. And then I was delighted afterwards to find out that they had seen me examining the parcel in the car, in the boot of the car, and that had been seized and the bloke had been nicked and all of that. So that was a pretty hairy time that evening. How was your emotional well-being during these years? By and large, because I was young, fit and fearless and absolutely ripping the granny out of life, um, I, I, I wasn't overly concerned. Mental health wasn't something we discussed. It wasn't really an expression any of us were familiar with. Eventually, of course, I became extremely well aware of the fragility and the importance of mental health because... I had a catastrophic mental health breakdown. I'd been working undercover for about a decade by now. I'd been involved in an operation that was very complex, some very tasty criminals. There was already a plot by these bad guys to kill me. And I knew about that, but I wasn't concerned about that. And I get a phone call, don't go home, from one of the bosses at the yard. I mean, what do you mean, Governor, don't go home? He said, don't go home. I can't tell you why, but you must not go home. By the close of play that day, it had been decided that I had to abandon my flat, abandon my identity, abandon the life I live, lived and enjoyed, 
and be hurriedly parachuted into the witness protection program. But then so began a two year unraveling of my mental health and my relationship. Tragically, sadly, regrettably, and um, it's a matter for which I carry a lot of shame still. And essentially that signaled the end of my undercover career, my police career and life as I've known it. So I was medically retired after my catastrophic mental health breakdown, medically retired from the police um, at the age of 40. So how long in total did you spend undercover and do you think that it was worth it? So in total I did about 10 years undercover. So whilst we thought we were doing good, locking up dealers, seizing lots of drugs, seizing loads of money, traveling the world, intercepting boats and all manner of things, we thought we were doing great. Actually, we were just taking part in a massive job creation scheme because for every group of drug dealers that we nicked, another one filled the void. Are there less drugs on the street as a result of my work? Oh, I can't help laughing as I say that, of course there aren't. Are there less guns on the street? Regrettably not. Um, yeah, and then the war on drugs just simply cannot and will, be, will not be won. We thought this was a war we could win. We were naive. Nobody had the ability to see what was coming around the corner. Nobody could really understand how massive the industry would become and the illegal drugs industry is now the fourth biggest industry in the world. We need a complete radical rethink. And by that, I mean that we have to, number one, legalize and, and never separate these words, legalize and regulate the entire illegal drugs industry. It is the only way we will rip it from the vice-like grip of organised crime. We will reduce so much harm, we will dramatically reduce the prison population, the government will raise billions upon billions in tax revenue, the drugs will be lawfully manufactured under licence in clean, sterile, suitable manufacturing facilities. But if we beat the criminals on price, purity and availability, they'll have nowhere to go. Would you recommend to a young person a career in policing? I know policing gets bad publicity these days. I know the job is far, far different from the one that I did, especially the challenges faced by uniform cops these days. And um, I can quite easily say it's more difficult. And my answer to that is a resounding yes. There is so much variety within policing. If you like horses, go and join the mounted branch. If you like catching criminals, either work on the front line, and the front line, by crikey, what a job that is these days, catch criminals, make a difference, save people's lives. If you want to be a detective, be a detective. That, for me, is the ultimate role. Work undercover, catch criminals, and if you commit to every task, every day, even when that is very difficult, you will have a career of public service that you can look back on with great pride. If I could have my time all over again, I would definitely join the police without a shadow of a doubt, without any hesitation. I've worked extremely hard. I've no shame in saying that. I'm proud to say that. Traveled far and wide, having by and large a great and terrifying time all rolled into one. Um, but when I reflect upon it, yeah, the overwhelming majority of it was a complete and utter waste of time. The door burst open again and these four hooded figures came in and they started walking around me. As this was going on, the guy was looking down at me, asking me questions, and I became convinced that I wasn't going to leave there in one piece. 